Hello, 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 hello. Welcome to the very first podcast episode of Rooted in Resilience. This is a podcast that I am developing, and our mission is to elevate the melanated mind. I am your host, Dr. Vanessa R. Brooks, and to um, to premiere or to debut our very first podcast episode, I am going to uh, just be here talking and sharing, uh, but then uh, in future episodes, I am looking to have um, guests to join us in the studio. And so if you wanna join us, uh, if you are a mental health professional, if you are an African-American, you know, we, we tend to kind of uh, market to African-American professional women, but if you are a, 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 in a part of the American, African-American diaspora, uh, male or female, we'd love to have you join us if you are a clergy, uh, because a lot of the conversation we're going to have has to do with the intersections of mental well-being and our faith. And so we are looking to bring in a guest into the studio with us. So just uh, keep that in mind if you decide that this is something that you might want to do. So I've got my notes because I'm a researcher. That's what we do, right? We, we do a lot of research and we try to uh, provide you with uh, research-backed, evidence-based uh, uh, research. And so I'm going to be looking at my notes a lot. So if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, you're going to see me doing this a lot. And if you're listening to us on the uh, audio podcast, Chow Link will matter because you ain't going to see us anyway. So before we go into uh, the, the, the podcast today, I want to share uh, just an anecdote, a story. And I think this is a story that many of us will be able to relate to because as you are aware, if you are of the African-American diaspora, of uh, African descent, uh, we know in our community that uh, there is a resistance uh, to uh, the conversation of mental health. There is a lot of stigma around the uh, conversation of health and receiving treatment. And if you're not a part of the African-American um, community or you're not of African descent, uh, maybe you are not aware of that, but you will find more out about that today because today on the podcast, we're gonna talk about um, the religious and the historical implications of mental health stigma within the African-American community. So let me go ahead and begin by sharing with you this beautiful, powerful, but heartbreaking uh, anecdote, this story that I think many of you will be able to relate to. So make sure you leave a comment in the comment section and let me know if you can relate to this to this story. Before I forget, uh, if for those of you who are watching us on YouTube, if you have not done so, please make sure that you give this video a thumbs up. Make sure that you engage by leaving comments. And if you have not done so, please uh, subscribe to our channel and turn on that bell so that you can get notified when we share content. So here is the story I want to leave with because it's going to shed light on the very pervasive stigma that does surround mental health. All right, so here is the story. Imagine a family gathering filled with laughter, love, and the comforting aroma of soul food wafting through the air. As the matriarch of the family, Grandma Ruby, holds court at the center of the room, wriggling her grandchildren with stories of resilience and strength passed down through the generations. Yet, amidst the joyous chatter a hushed tone descends when the topic shifts to mental health. In the corner, Auntie May, a vibrant and successful professional, lowers her gaze as she mentions her therapy session to manage her anxiety. Suddenly, the room falls silent and whispers of, she's just going through a phase and pray it away, float through the air like a heavy cloud. The unspoken rule of silence around mental health descends, suffocating Auntie May's vulnerability and isolating her in a sea of judgment and misunderstanding. This scene is all too familiar in many African-American households, and it highlights the deep-rooted stigma and the taboo surrounding mental health. So the fear of being labeled as weak, the pressure to uphold the facade of strength and the resilience on, or the reliance on faith alone to navigate mental struggles creates a barrier that present, prevents open dialogue and healing. And so I wanna invite you to join me on this podcast 
as we together unravel the layers of stigma, challenging misconceptions and celebrating the resilience and courage of individuals within the African-American community. Those of us who dare to speak their truth and seek support for our mental well-being. I believe, and I hope you do too, that it's time to dismantle the walls of silence and shame surrounding mental well-being. It's time for us to embrace a culture of compassion, understanding, and acceptance when it comes to mental health in the African-American community. And so this podcast, Rooted in Resilience podcast, where we are here to, um, to elevate melanated minds. This podcast is where I invite you to join me on this journey as we together navigate the intersection of mental health and culture. And we wanna embrace that with empathy and insight. So today on this very first episode of Rooted in Resilience podcast, I'm gonna be sharing from an article titled The Culture of Stigma surrounding depression in the African-American family and community. And this article was written by Wynetta Wimberly. She um, is a scholar. Hold on just a second. I want to tell you more about her. There we go. I want to get her bio up here. She's a scholar and she's an adjunct professor of pastoral theology at Care and Counseling and Care and Counseling at Kaitler, a uh, Candler School of Theology, uh, Emory University. And she's on the staff at Emory University as well, the, the Emory University School of Medicine. She's also an ordained pastor in the American Baptist churches with over 25 years of experience serving the local church. Dr. Wimberly is also a clinically trained pastoral counselor and consultant to clergy and churches in crisis. So I'm not sure if you know this or not, but there is a mental health crisis in the African American community, specifically um, with depression and anxiety. And so uh, Ms. Wimberly identifies the African American, uh, the American transatlantic slave trade as a historical trauma and also a cultural factor for the depression that both the enslaved and the freed Africans experienced in this country, including those of us of African descent. So I wanna talk about historical trauma, okay? Um, it's a theory and, and the theory is uh, that a historical trauma is the cumulative emotional and psychological wounding over the lifespan and across generations and emanating from massive group trauma experiences. So um, obviously the transatlantic slave trade will uh, qualify based on that definition. And so a cursory re review of the history of America reveals an unconscionable record of inhumane treatment towards enslaved and freed Africans and persons of African descent. Ours is an oppressive history and it is fraught with dehumanization, racial injustice, and the systematic alienation of both the enslaved and the freed Africans in America by European Americans. So it is also socially constructed to foster an ideology of white racial superiority. And it's really important that we emphasize that white racial superiority is a social construct. It is not true at all. White Americans are not superior to black Americans, nor anyone for that matter. But without question, the psychological and physiological brutality experienced by both enslaved and freed Africans in American Slovakracy has had a transgenerational impact on the psyche of African Americans collectively. Now I want you just to stop and meditate on that with me. I want you to understand that we have a collective injury to our psyche, okay? And so even though those of us who are alive today did not personally experience um, the brutality of um, uh, the time uh, experienced by our, the, our enslaved ancestors, if you understand how historical trauma is transmitted intergenerationally, then you must also understand that in your psyche and in the psyche of all of us as descendants of, African, uh, of, Af of Africans, we all have this, this collective psyche, um, this injured psyche, okay? 
it's really important that you understand that when we start talking about trauma uh, stigma and how to um, eradicate or at least mitigate uh, the stigma of mental health in the African American community, uh, you'll begin to understand why that is such a difficult feat because we have a collective uh, psyche injury. Okay. Uh, she goes on to say here that transgenerational trauma is the unresolved trauma. Hear that? It is the unresolved trauma passed from one generation to the next, and the effects of which are also passed on when left unresolved. Okay, so we're talking about centuries of unresolved trauma that's been passed on from generation to generation. And not only has the trauma been passed on from generation to generation, the effects of that trauma has also been passed on. Okay, and it's also been left unresolved within the African American community. Stigma surrounding mental health, mental illness and mental health treatment remains a significant problem, particularly among African Americans. Okay, so we have a problem here. The problem is the stigma, okay? The stigma around mental illness in our community creates a situation where there is a barrier to us getting the mental health treatment that we need. So she writes here that the African-American cultural stigma of depression as a sign of weakness causes African-Americans to believe they must uphold the image of strength or resilience at the expense of negating their own psychological or emotional health. Did you hear that? All right. So within our culture, okay, within our culture, the stigma that is associated with depression uh, uh, creates a, a situation where we see depression as a weakness. Okay. And we've been taught generationally that as the descendants of the enslaved Africans, that we should be strong and that we should be resilient. OK, and so we are we are historically resilient people, which is why the podcast is called Rooted in Resilience, because that is our roots. Our roots are very much uh, in uh, of that of strength and resilience. OK, however, however, we can no longer uh, continue um, negating our own psychological or emotional health at the expense of trying to be resilient or strong. OK. So we want you to learn that resilience and strength are, are um, they are gifts that we have been given by God, okay, to help us, but they are not gifts uh, to be, to, uh, that were given to us to cause us to negate our own mental health and emotional health wellness, okay? So I want you to know today that you can be both strong, all right, and deal with your mental health illnesses. You can be resilient and deal with your mental health illness, okay? You can be both of those things. You can be both strong and resilient and take care of your mental and emotional health, okay? That's really important for us to understand on today. So she goes on to say here in the article, African-Americans have consistently held firm, for, 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 let me start over. African-Americans have consistently held firm to a group, to a group identity. So that's really important within the African-American community is our group identity. Um, this is why we're going to talk about the importance of the black church in just a little bit. OK, so within our community, group is really important. OK, we um, we uh, we find our identity in groups. OK. So adhering to a collective identity stems from an, an ancestral ethos that posits community as central to life. So again, we're talking about our history as the descendants of African slaves or, or the enslaved. We're also talking about our history um, as it pertains to our African-American ancestors. And within the African-American community, again, um, the group concept was really important. Um, it's how we identified ourselves. So it is a part of our ancestral ethos, okay? And that's not bad. We just need to be made aware of these things so we can start looking at ways to improve um, or again, to mitigate the stigma. And so we know a couple things already. We know that we have a, an, an injured collective psyche based on the traumas, uh, the unresolved traumas and the, and the effects of the unresolved traumas within our African-American ancestors. We know that. We've also learned today that, um, that that group identity is really important to us. So we, as African-Americans, we tend to find our identity better within groups as opposed to uh, as individuals. 
And we know that this is, again, a part of our ancestral ethos. And so we're going to honor that. And we're going to use our history to work for us in creating situations where we are mitigating um, the stigma and we are embracing uh, the beauty of strength and resilience and the beauty of being emotionally and mentally healthy. So she goes on to say, African values stress collectivity, sharing, affiliation, obedience to authority, belief in spirituality, and respect for the elderly and the past. So again, these are some very important things to understand about our history as African Americans. So these are some things that were very important to us in terms of our core values, right? So collectivity was the core value that was really important within our community, okay? So again, uh, being a part of the collective, okay? Um, for people like me, um, where I'm a little bit of an introvert, uh, where my family is not necessarily uh, all that close, or at least I'm not all that close to my family, um, that's a difficult concept for me. So what I've had to do, and what many of you may have to do also, is to work on extended families, okay? Because families can be re-identified or redefined by you. And so within the African-American community, sharing was also important, okay? And so this idea of keeping things to ourselves and, and not sharing within the group, those are concepts or constructs that we picked up from being a part of European um, culture. But within the African-American culture, sharing was really something that is a part of, uh, that was a part of our culture. I remember, remember growing up as a child and my mother was very big on sharing. And so even though we didn't have much ourselves, I watched her share what we had, uh, what little we had. We, we, she shared it. She shared food. Uh, she shared clothes with kids in the neighborhood. She was just a woman who really uh, instilled in me the importance of sharing, okay, and not being selfish. And obedience to authority. Again, this might make you feel some kind of way. But I need you to understand this is a part of our culture, because, again, we're going to talk about the importance of pastors and the black church. And so culturally, um, obedience to authority is something that's really important to us. Um, now, you know, we may have to deconstruct some of that because we are, there's a lot of research coming out now where we talk about uh, what we're looking at. Things like religious trauma, that is absolutely, absolutely something that came out in my my own research study when I was doing my dissertation. Um, and so we'll talk about that down the road. But uh, so we may have to do some deconstructing and, and re redefine how we see um, spiritual um, obedience, uh, uh, obedience to authority. But that's definitely something that's, that's a part of our culture. And now I, I do want to say this article was written in 2015. So it's it's, you know, it's getting a little it's getting a little up there in age. But I thought it was just really a, a powerful article um, and I thought it was worth having this discussion today and I just really enjoy um, Miss Wimberly's work but it is it's, it's a bit dated so some of these uh, concepts uh, we've been able to update through research me myself uh, because again of my own research I'm, I'm I can update some of the things she's saying just a little bit and so even though we do uh, understand the importance of obedience to authority as far as our um, our legacy is concerned. Um, we do now have more research where we have to understand that some of that has to be uh, deconstructed. And then she talks about the belief in spirituality. So our African ancestors, uh, to them, spirituality was key. Okay. Um, it is really how they coped with their mental and emotional um, distress. Um, and so we want to honor spirituality. So again, this is why we're talking about um, religion. Now, again, I want to say for those of you who may be watching or listening to this podcast, and maybe you're not in a religious community, because um, since the time this article was written, the numbers are through the roof of folks who are leaving organized religion. And so I want you to know that down the road, probably in the next broadcast, actually, I'm going to talk to those of you who are not a part of religious um, cultures and communities. Um, just again to update some of the information that is being provided in this article today. So just hold tight. If you're not in a religious space, that's okay. I'm going to come back and talk to you in the in the very next episode. Y'all hold me to it so I don't forget, okay? Because you know, you're a divergent brain. I'd be all over the place. So I need y'all to remind me what I said, okay? Um, but spirituality does factor in. Um, and so this is why even in my research, and there's been a lot of other similar researches, uh, research studies done, uh, where I looked at um, uh, integration. I called it counseling integration. Um, I was talking or I was exploring the counseling practices of evangelical black clergy 
um, to see their willingness to also integrate evidence-based uh, interventions with their religious counseling. Um, and so there's a lot of research, a lot of conversation about faith integration, so faith and mental health integration. And that's really what this podcast is about as well, um, the importance of the intersections of faith and mental health and culture and mental health. And we have to have these conversations so that we can get to the stage of solutions and healing, okay? So this is all about healing for us in the African-American community. And so we're going to have these conversations because I think together as a collective, there's that word again, as a community, when we come together, when we have these Socratic conversations and these Socratic discussions that we ask questions, even if the questions are difficult, even if the questions make us uncomfortable, but it's in the Socratic questioning, it's in the discussion collaboratively as a community that I believe we're going to be able to get to some real tangible solutions and healing for our community. All right, I'm going to go back to the article. So she says, what is particularly distinctive about the African-American community is his regard for the communal influence upon a person's behavior, okay? So listen to this because now she's talking about how community affects our behavior. The notion of a perceived loss of community is derived in part from prevailing themes of interdependence, relationality, and extended family networks. Each theme reinforces the idea of self-identity being achieved within the confines of the community. So that's a little bit different from what we know as individualism, right? In the African American um, community, um, and, and I, you know, again because because of my own family system, um, a lot of these things I really just did not understand until I became a researcher, and um, it's really helping me to um, uh, change my delivery and my approach um, in this space of having conversations about mental health and African Americans. Um, I, when I initially started talking about, you know, um, depression and mental health issues within the community, within the African American community and the church, I was just giving like raw data, raw facts and statistics and research. And I wanted people just to, you know, receive it. And there was a little bit of resistance, a lot of resistance and backlash. But the more I began to, to, to allow me, my, 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 my implicit biases to be put on the back burner and to approach it from a position of um, wanting to understand our community and how we receive information, it allowed me to repackage my approach to this whole space um, because I want to be effective. And so what I now understand is that when I'm talking to um, African-Americans uh, with us within a community, um, that there are certain things that I need to understand. And I, and I, I did not understand these things at a collective level because again, um, some of these things are not things that I experienced within my own family system. And so I was um, I was almost assuming, I think, that everybody else's uh, family system within the African-American community kind of functioned like mine. And I'm going to go and do, a, we're going to do a whole broadcast, a whole podcast about, you know, dysfunctional families and all that. And all that. But, but it's really important that we understand um, how the fabric of the traditional collective African-American family um, responds to, um, you know, behavior and, and, and mental wellness so that we can bring those solutions. And so when we think about African-American uh, communities, um, again, our identity, the self-identity that we develop is really rooted in, um, you know, the interdependence, us, you know, depending on each other and being relational with each other. Um, and, and so again, um, even if you don't have that within your own biological family, um, look for ways to uh, create an extended family network so that you can begin to connect to the relationality piece and the interdependence piece. I know myself, and I think a lot of Black women can attest to this, that I, I, I really operate and have always operated out of this strong Black woman trope, this strong Black independent Black woman trope. Um, and, and so some of us, somehow, because I think of our battles in corporate uh, working with uh, Europeans, we've, we've had to present ourselves as very strong and very independent. And so we've kind of lost culturally, um, uh, you know, our interdependence and our relational um, cultural values. And so um, this is an opportunity for us to, uh, you know, to re-embrace our culture and celebrate our culture. So she goes on to say here, 
um, that pastoral psychologist Lee Butler identifies this in his assertion that our self finds meaning and significance through relationship, through relationship. And so again, for people like me who are on the um, independent side of things, who are on the introvert side of things, who battle with like low self-esteem and rejection and just didn't really put herself, didn't really feel comfortable, you know, in group spaces. Um, I need to, I needed to as a researcher, as someone who wants to bring healing and, and solutions to the community, I needed to understand the significance of this, that relationship is very important to the African American community. And so um, what I began to realize when I was studying, um, you know, religious deconstruction and uh, the correlation of religious trauma uh, on those who deconstruct things. Um, one of the things I found out is that there are a lot of people who who want to maybe even deconstruct or expand their um, their spiritual practices and their spirituality, but this fear of isolation, this fear of being without community, this fear of not being in relationship with people is, is weighing for a lot of people in the African-American community. And because again, I'm such a loner anyway, that was something that I really did not factor in when I was having these conversations in the early days. And so this is where I, um, through my educational journey, have really matured and I understand the importance of community and relationship within the African-American community. And, and there's going to be resistance if we try to bring solutions and healing, no matter how great they are, um, if we, if we um, negate to understand our own community. So he goes on, she goes on to say that this is rooted in the African adage, I am because we are. Whew. Again, this is a part of our culture. And, and this culture is that uh, culturally as African Americans, we relied on each other for support. So mutuality and respect and support was really important to our African and African American ancestors and our African um, ancestors. And I think there's not just me, I think a lot of us have lost that culture, that cultural base, that 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 cultural foundation. And I think again, a lot of that has to do with um, the perceived um, system of racial superiority that we've had to navigate with and we've had to fight against for so long that I think we've just really removed ourselves unconsciously from our own cultural base. So we got to we got to return. We got to go back, right? And and remember remember our cultural foundation as African Americans. Um, so she says, without a semblance of community, African Americans lack a sense of identity, self esteem, cohesion, and shared purpose. I'm gonna read that one more time. Without a semblance of community, African Americans lack a sense of identity, self esteem cohesion and shared purpose, the absence of which proves injurious to the psyche when coupled with depression. So I want you to think about that and why so many people in the African-American community suffer in silence with depression because there is a fear of being without community. There is a fear of being without relationship. There is a fear of being alone. Okay. Um, there's a fear of loss of identity. Okay. There's a fear, there's a fear of low self-esteem. If, if we confess that we have mental health issues, specifically, we're talking today about depression. Um, there is a feeling of a loss of shared purpose. If people think that we are weak or that we are crazy or that something is wrong with us mentally. And so we keep it to ourselves and we suffer in silence. All right, and we and we negate the importance of receiving treatment. Okay, I am one person who do understand this part of our culture because I was a pastor and I was a, a leader in the community. And so I knew that I was battling with probably some emotional and mental health issues, but I dare not go seek treatment for them because I did not want to lose my self-esteem as a pastor, as a trusted, um, esteemed member of the clergy. I didn't want to lose that, okay? I, I was a leader in the workplace. I didn't want to lose the prestige of, you know, what came with being a pastor um, in a community, especially a small community. And so I dare not talk to anybody about what I was feeling. And so I did what many of us do. I spiritualized my mental health issues, right? Because I didn't want to lose 
um, the acceptance and the validation. I didn't want to lose that sense of shared purpose that I had with other clergy, right? So I kept a lot of things inside of myself. And it's just been this year, 2024, that I went ahead and sought professional mental health. I think I did years ago, 20 years ago, one time I went to therapy, was prescribed some meditation, took two pills, and I was like, no, God going to heal me. Um, many of you do that too. But this year, um, at the culmination of my um, deconstruction journey, which I'll talk about that later, um, at the culmination of me finishing my doctoral education and studying mental health, um, I knew that I was not going to be able to really stand in the truth of my own research if I continue to negate my own mental and emotional wellness. And so, yes, I was uh, diagnosed with ADHD, something I've known for years that I've had since I was a child. Um, just back in those days, nobody called it that. Um, so I was officially diagnosed with ADHD. So I'm neurodivergent. I was officially diagnosed with anxiety, um, PTSD, and depression. Um, a lot of that came from my time um, in ministry, which we'll talk about as this, as this uh, podcast progresses. But um, I'm, I'm sharing that to share with you that I am one of those people that she's talking about here where we allow ourselves to suffer in silence and we end up, we end up with what she calls um, an injury to the psyche. So when you couple of take, you're already depressed, right? And you have all these other issues going on, the stigma of, of getting help. And so um, you couple that with um, um, depression, she calls it an injury to the psyche. Okay. That's just not healthy. That's not a good place for us to be. She says, from this viewpoint, the threat of social isolation places added strain on individuals with already limited webs of human connection. A lot of us as African Americans, if we're not with our own people, our other human connections are limited. Okay? And so we already are dealing with social isolation in many cases because um, just in terms of demographics, there are, you know, financial barriers that prevent African Americans from doing um, a lot of, you know, social activities. And so they already feel isolated. So, you know, if, if they have to go to their communities or their groups, whether that's the church or their sorority sisters and share their mental health journey, again, there's a fear of social isolation. There's a fear of those people not wanting to remain in connection with them. So we are afraid of losing human connection. We are afraid of social isolation. And I can tell you again, uh, when I stopped pastoring and came home, um, I was working from home full time, but it, when I was pastoring and preaching, I had a, a really, um, you know, pretty busy social life. Um, and once I came home and, and left ministry and, you know, took a five year sabbatical from church, um, I know firsthand what social isolation feels like, which really um, exacerbated my depression and it exacerbated my other um, mental health challenges. And so I'm here to tell you firsthand, I know what this is like because I experienced it. Okay. And so we've got to do better in the African American community with creating a, um, um, a space where people feel safe enough to tell us what they're dealing with and not worry about us leaving them or disconnecting from them so that people can feel comfortable in seeking mental health professionals so they can get the help with the treatment that they need. I'm almost done, y'all. So let's talk about social capital here. Um, so she says that when depression is considered a sign of weakness, okay, that it exacerbates feelings of isolation and provokes a type of nonconformity to communally established norms. I'm going to read that one more time because I was just talking to y'all about that. She says, when depression is considered a sign of weakness, it exacerbates feelings of isolation and it provokes a type of nonconformity to communally established norms. Okay, so when you're dealing with depression and you think that you're weak, okay, it's going to make you feel very uncomfortable trying to associate yourself within communal spaces, what we call normal communities. Okay. So then you, now you're isolating yourself even the more. 
okay? So again, that feeling of isolation is, is it exas it's exacerbated now because now you don't feel like you are uh, mentally well and you don't feel like you are um, capable or competent enough to be in what we call normal spaces. So you retreat away from everybody else. So that's a, that's a, there's an increased fear, an increased um, um, feeling of isolation, okay? And and that can be borderline dangerous because that's when we start, you know, having conversations about you know suicide ideation within the African American community. Right now, suicide is the third leading cause of death for African American males, and we know that um, our African American females between grades nine and 12 are 60% more likely to attempt suicide than non-Hispanic um, white people, okay? So we have to really um, take all of this into consideration and understand the seriousness and the, and the severity of untreated depression within our community. So let's talk about social capital because uh, uh, Ms. Wimberly argue, argues in the article here that social capital is the key to mitigating mental health stigma, okay? So what is social capital? Social capital is a term frequently used within the spheres of public health, okay? And it is used to describe how a group maximizes the strength of its human relationships to form social support networks that provide social control, collective efficacy, and cohesion, which is bonding and trust, okay? So social capital, when we talk about social capital, we're talking about um, how a group of people takes advantage of the strength of human relationships. So again, within the African-American community, a lot of times um, social capital or our social support systems can be found in our churches, um, in our sororities, um, um, even even our digital social support networks now with social media being such a um, powerful tool for uh, connecting human connection, even social media. So digital social support systems. OK. And so these social support systems provide um, social control. It makes us feel like we are in control of our social um, our social socialization skills, our socialization, our social activities, right? It also provides us with a sense of efficacy, right? Um, that we are able, that we're capable of, 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 of um, navigating our, our life. It also creates a situation where um, we feel um, a sense of bonding and trust in these social support systems or these social support networks. And so social support or social capital Social capital networking is very important when we start talking about um, healing and, and mitigating stigma within our community. And so I'm going to start asking you to think about what social uh, capital do you have in your life? Um, do you have social capital? Do you have groups um, where you can experience this efficacy and where you can experience bonding and trust, right? Do you have um, groups where you find where you can draw strength in human relationships, it is not good to be alone. Okay, it is not it is not healthy to be alone all the time. So even if you are an introvert like me, you still need to have you know social capital or social support network networks in place where you can draw strength from those human relationships. So according to Wimberly, there is three social capital networks that she argues can bring. Um, healing to the African American community in terms of our mental health, um, specifically depression, for today's conversation. And she says that is the Black Pastor, the Extended Family Network, and the African American Congregation. So, again, for those of you who are not a part of the religious system, don't feel left out. I'm coming back to help you next week, okay? But this is for those of you who are um, Christian, um, and we know that there are a lot of different denominations of Christianity. Um, but for those of you that are, are practicing some faith, and even if you're not um, a Christian, I'm going to update her her findings just a little bit and talk to you about. Um, and maybe I'll say that for the next for the for the next broadcast because I was going to say um, there are a lot of other spiritual communities, even if it's not a congregation, that you can consider being a part of. But we'll talk about that in the next broadcast. So um, what we do know, and even though the this article is dated. Um, the research, even as, as, as late as 2023, still substantiates 
what she says here. Um, that the people who struggle with depression in the African American community um, are not likely to seek out mental health professionals um, or medication for treatment. Okay, what we know through the research is that African Americans who are struggling with depressive symptoms prefer to seek out counseling from clergy. Okay, that's why the Black Church is so important plays a, crit a critical role, a key role in helping us mitigate the stigma because black folks, you know, collectively are going to go to the church for help. They're not going to go to mental health professionals because they don't trust mental health professionals. They don't trust our public health system. They don't trust our medical system. They don't trust the, the, the antidepressant medications. And so they're going to go to the church house. Okay. And so it's really important for us to understand that. Um, so historically, the black preacher, she says, has been instrumental in journeying with enslaved and freed Africans through the transitory seasons of life as a spiritual guide, teacher, and comforting presence amidst social oppression. I myself can, can speak to this because, again, I was a pastor, and I can tell you firsthand that I was very instrumental in helping a lot of my congregations uh, my congregants go through different transitory seasons of their life, whether it was death or divorce or loss of job or some health issues, some health scare, um, even, you know, death. Um, I've, I've journeyed with them through all of that, through grief, um, through mental health issues. I had members who had bipolar and depression. And so they they turned to me. They wanted my help. They were not um, they were not excited about going to. Um, to mental health professionals or going to any uh, medical professional with these issues. They wanted me to take care of that. And so um, that is something that historically has been a part of the um, Black preacher experience. And so Wimberly says here, I lost my spot, y'all. Hold on one second. She says, I consider the Black pastor to be a pivotal communal component in the eradication of the stigma of depression in the African-American community. I'm going to read that one more time. This is to all my black pastors who are listening. Okay. To all my black pastors who are listening, I, I theorize that your number one ministry needs to be mental health in your church. Okay. You need to be promoting mental health, not demonizing it. Not demonizing it, but promoting it. Okay. I agree with Wimberly. She says, I consider the black pastor to be a pivotal communal component in the eradication of the stigma of depression in the African American community. So if we want to eradicate, eliminate, wipe out the stigma surrounding depression in the African American community. This is the primary responsibility of the black pastor. She says here, fundamentally, he or she affords African Americans the mutuality, respect, and personhood they fail to experience within white supremacy systems. Whether you know it or not, as much as I love mental health, mental health like medical health health uh, health in america is rooted in white supremacy okay all these systems are rooted in white supremacy and so that means that the interventions the therapeutic frameworks they're all created through a lens of white superiority so they don't factor in the cultural experiences the socioeconomic experiences the racial experiences of African Americans in this country who are experiencing mental, el mental illness or depression. They're not factoring that in when they're creating these, when they're creating these uh, therapeutic frameworks, when they're creating these evidence-based interventions. They're not creating them with you or I in mind. This is why when we do go seek out mental health, uh, mental health uh, uh, therapy, specifically if we go to a white mental health professional, we don't feel a connection. We don't feel safe. We don't, see, we don't feel seen. 
we don't feel heard because they are not trained to um to be culturally competent yeah they take some culturally competent classes in school but in many cases they just do that to get an a in the class so they can get out of there cultural competence is something that has to take place in the heart this is why in my dissertation research study one of the things i theorized um, is that we need to ensure that uh, mental health professionals are culturally competent. And even the black mental health professionals need cultural competence they are training because they still went through the same system of educational training uh, created by white people for white people. Okay, I digress. Secondly, she says, the extended family network can also serve as a resource for those stigmatized by depression and so again, even if in your immediate family there's a resistance, or if they shame you, um, if they if they silence you, if they um, isolate you, you need to look for an extended family network, even if that is a digital in a digital space. Okay. Um, the kinship and the family network is vital within the African American community. She says, historically, protecting and caring for family members who were unable to assume communal postures of strength or resilience was an important role carried out by the extended family. And then lastly, she says the congregation. So it's not just the pastors. Oh, no, 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 no. Those of you sitting in the pews, those of you sitting out there in the audience, okay, the congregation, you are also one of the social um, capital, uh, one of the uh, capital, uh, social capital supports uh, that we need for uh, individuals who are experiencing depression. Okay. She says the congregation or community of believers can also provide an added layer of communal support for individuals stigmatized by depression. The programmatic nature of the black church is such that it allows for the construction of educational, therapeutic, and preventive opportunities for its members. You understand that? You know why the church is such a um, efficacious resource for eliminating stigma because it's already um, pro education in many in many cases because they have Bible studies they have Sunday schools okay they, they already have um, like this 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 learning space uh, the church has conferences all the time workshops all the time right so it's already um, feasible that the church would be um, well suited for educational spaces in terms of mental health education. All right. This is what I do for a living, especially now that I have completed my doctoral education. What I do now is I create mental health educational workshops, interventions um, to go into um, spaces, communal spaces such as churches schools, organizations, and I talk about ways that we can mitigate, eliminate stigma, promote mental health. We even talk a lot about self-help um, uh, interventions and self-care strategies for those of us who are in the African-American community and ways that we can participate in promoting wellness and resilience in the African-American space. Really important. So if you need help with that, you reach out to me today. And I'll be more than happy to do a complimentary con uh, con uh, consultation with you. And we can discuss ways that I can create um, some, some custom training for your um, for your group, for your communal group. OK, because this is, again, really important. So finally, she says, since workshops and seminars bode well in progressive African-American congregations, these types of learning opportunities can one dispel the culture of stigmatiz stigmatization through education Two, provide a therapeutic group holding environment uh, for those endeavoring to emerge from the isolation of stigmat stigmatization and three teach pastors how to identify depression within their congregation that's exactly what i just said okay workshops and seminars are already being um had at churches churches already have workshops you already have seminars, you already have educational spaces and learning opportunities. And so it's perfect for you to then um, engage in these mental health educational workshops. Okay. Because again, doing this will help your congregation as well as yourself 
to dispel the culture or, or, or these educational interventions will dispel the culture of stigmatization within uh, the African-American community through education. OK, and that is exactly the model that my business used. OK, we're using that same model of we are going to uh, mitigate uh, mental health depression in the African-American community through education. All right. We're going to also do it in communal spaces, groups. OK, to provide that therapeutic environment that we uh, that we appreciate in the African-American community. And it's also a great way to help people to not feel isolation. OK, because of the stigma. And then finally, it's a wonderful way to teach pastors how to identify depression within their congregations. I might get in a little bit of trouble here. You'll hear me say a lot uh, on this podcast. Um, we've got to we've got to also deconstruct from how pastors and congregation members uh, view depression and mental health. Okay, you've got to stop demonizing it. You just got to. Okay, uh, one of the things that I argue for in my research is the need for theological expansion. I'm not going to go into all that today, but that's one area where we've got to expand theologically because calling demonic, uh, calling depression demonic, is very demoralizing creates more stigma and it creates more isolation, resulting in more people um, suffering in silence and not getting treated for their, for their help, for, for the uh, treated for the depression and getting the help that they need. OK, so no more calling depression demons. OK, no more doing that. No more calling mental health demonic, uh, mental health issues demonic. OK, no more calling mental illness demonic. No more demonizing depression. Everybody got that? So she says here, and I'm ending, extensive research and education on depression in Black families will aid in breaking the cycle of the stigmatization of depression by broadening the conversations so that individuals can feel safe in obtaining the help that they need. Again, that is exactly what we do here at Brooks Consulting and Training Solutions. We are here to create spaces where we can have conversations communal conversations because we know through the research that when we create containers for community within the African-American community that it creates a feeling of safety and when we feel safe we can start having conversations and more people can learn the truth about depression we can take the stigmas out and people can start getting the help that they need and deserve okay that is the whole purpose of Brooks Consulting and Training Solutions. That is the whole purpose of the Rooted in Resilience podcast. We want melanated minds to be healed and whole, okay? This is Dr. Vanessa R. Brooks. Thank you for joining me today on our very first podcast episode. I am so excited um, to be in this space and I hope that you'll join me, okay? I hope that you'll support this, um, this platform. So wherever you happen to uh, find this 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 podcast, whether it was on my YouTube channel or whether it was on one of the podcast um, streaming platforms, please, please, please make sure you like, subscribe, follow, leave a comment, engage, do all the things, okay? Uh, make sure for those of you who are watching on YouTube, again, that you are following this channel, give this video a thumbs up, leave a comment, all right? And make sure that you visit our website, www.brooksconsultingandtrainingsolutions.com for all of your mental health um, solutions-driven needs. If you are in need of having um, me come in and do some mental health educational um, interventions and some workshops to talk about you know, how we can be, uh, eliminate the stigma, um, talk about self-care, resilience strategies, whether it's your, uh, your church or your you know, for the school kids or for your, um, for the school teachers, uh, whether it's for your, your, your corporate, um, your corporate uh, 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 spaces as well. I'm here to serve you. I want to see melanated minds be educated about mental health so that we can stop feeling the shame and the guilt and the isolation so we can stop suffering in silence and get the help the treatment that we need and deserve. Okay. I'll see you in the next podcast. All right. Grace and peace, peace and blessings, love and light. Namaste. I am signing out right there.